And joining us here on set in Washington, we have Republican Congressman from Texas and Republican presidential candidate Representative Ron Paul. And we have the host of MSNBC's Now with Alex Wagner. Alex Wagner, <laughs> very good to have you with us. Uh, my goodness. Um, uh, first of all, Congressman Paul, are you still campaigning or, or what are we doing? Always here? campaigning. You're always I've campaigning. I've been campaigning for 30 some years. <laughs> 34 years. What else campaign. would you do? <laughs> I would not know what to do if I couldn't campaign, campaign for my favorite subject, and that is personal liberty. Yes. That okay. Is my goal. That's fair. So let's look at the state of the campaign. I want to ask you about Mitt Romney. You're not ready to endorse him, obviously. No. Okay. Uh, can I ask you a question about him? Well, I would think that's what I'm here for. Okay. <laughs> has Mitt Romney shown himself to be someone who has clear convictions on the key issues that are important to the Republican Party? Do you, am I, you're asking me whether he does? Yes, and whether he's shown himself well, to be someone who has clear convictions. The Republican Party of the last several decades, I would say he has core convictions, but I just disagree with them. Okay. Because the core convictions aren't what I think we sometimes pretend we believe in and what we have believed in in the past. So therefore, those core convictions are something that I'd like to change. I'd like to change those convictions of the Republican Party because there were times when they had much better positions and there's no reason why we can't restore those and improve upon them. So the Republican Party has lost its way. Would you agree with, for example, what Jeb Bush uh, said recently uh, in critiquing your party? Well, I think it has lost its way. I think uh, a long a long time ago. I, I, I can't see the difference. Uh, foreign policy. We get Obama, we get George Bush. What significant change are there? They're both very militaristic, interventionist, pro-war. When it comes to the Fed, do, do they really want to challenge the Fed and the printing of money and financing debt? No. Do the Republicans really stop welfare expansion? No. Do they really cut back and balance the budget? No. They usually introduced bigger budgets, you know, generally over the years, whether it was uh, Reagan or Bush. They, they spent a lot of money. So I would say the people have been misled into thinking that, oh, there's a big contest going on out there. Uh, I, I don't. I, I think that uh, personality-wise and power struggle, there are, real, there are real contests going. But when it comes to to the philosophy of government, there's not enough difference for me. Sam Stein. All right, so the conventional wisdom is that Rick Santorum won the Iowa caucus, and then we find out this past week that your campaign actually gets 23 of the state's 28 delegates right. to the convention, and you've scored similar wins like that in well, again, Nevada, Louisiana, Maine, other states. What are you going to do with all these delegates? What's the end game here? Well, unfortunately, we don't have quite enough, you know, to <laughs> take over the convention. Okay, that was, but, that was the ultimate goal. But, but what's I the think goal? that and, uh, under, under the rules, they're going to restrain us because as of now, uh, I'm not sure whether I will have a public presence. But we will have a presence, the organization, because even those many, many who have been nominated and elected as delegates yeah. and will be obligated to vote for Romney are really our supporters. So that means the atmosphere, the uh, what, what's going on, uh, platform sure. fights, and, this, and and the excitement will be with our group. Have you have you asked or have you been asked by Mitt Romney to have a speaking portion at the convention? No, I have not asked specifically, and he hasn't invited me to. We we uh, under the rule, if we'd have had five clear cut wins, yeah. you know, in the state, they would have been obligated to allow my name be uh, nominated and then give a speech which would be my speech, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and a 15-minute speech. And th that, right now, because of the questionable way of who gets seated, and sometimes uh, these delegations uh, would win them, and, you know, in Nevada, it's controversial. One last, one last second question. What, how are you hoping to influence the party platform? What specifically do you want in the language that would placate your hordes of followers? <laughs> uh, precisely, definitely follow the Constitution. Okay. Whether it's on declaration of war, whether it has to do with monetary policy, whether it has to do with doing things that are not uh, unauthorized, like the welfare state, we want to challenge the whole thing. Yep. Okay, Alex Wagner now. Dr. Paul, I want to go back to something that Mika said. You're often seen as an outlier for the Republican Party. Uh, do you think the tent is big enough right now? And if Mitt Romney loses in November, what do you think the repercussions are for the GOP? 
Well, I always think that no matter what comes of it, there should be a positive outcome for it. Uh, so, uh, do you think I, there will shame, be? I know the word outlier is, is a common term, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing you, but, but really the problem is, is the Republican Party has become the outlier uh-huh. for the cause of liberty and what they pretend. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I want to work on the, on the platform, but we know platforms uh, don't change people's attitudes. What, that's what we want to do, get attention to change in the attitude so that we who are perceived as outliers become the insiders. And that's what's happening. That's what people aren't quite aware of because we're winning uh, state delegations and state chairmen and small offices anywhere from uh, uh, city councils to county commissioners. That's what's happening. All you have to do, uh, and it's the subject hasn't come yeah. up yet, Look at the next generation. I mean, there is so much excitement out there. And, uh, and, it, and although we have uh, you know, the greatest influence on young people, uh, this movement, which is, uh, they think that's all? No. We have a lot of people who are joining who aren't under 30. But the big deal is, is that the next generation are sick and tired of what they're getting, and they're looking for something. And what we're offering seems to have great appeal uh, to the young people because they know they're getting a bad deal, they're getting bankruptcy, they're getting war, they're getting uh, just all the problems so, dumped on them. Dr. Paul, I'm going to throw a couple of things out there. Alex, you take a question for this. I'm going to end on reading you a part of Joe's piece from Politico. But I understand your campaign plans to hold its own event prior to right. the convention. So uh, the question is, are you helping or hurting the party um, by separating yourself so close to the convention? But also, um, Here's what Joe writes, and and, and it plays into the issue of conviction uh, in the leaders in the Republican Party and his worry about not only the Republican presidential field that uh, went through the primary process, but those who didn't uh, join, join in to try and run for president. He voted for you. Why I voted for Ron Paul, Politico. Uh, While Romney was distancing himself from Ronald Reagan, Ron Paul was fighting with Republicans to balance the budget for the first time in a generation. While Santorum was supporting an unprecedented expansion of entitlement spending, Paul was warning of a great recession that would be caused by government interference in the housing market. And while Gingrich was talking about how he would build up the federal government to push his conservative of agenda, Congressman Paul spent all his waking hours focused on dismembering that big government beast. We can't think of anyone who ran in the Republican field or even in the Senate and in Congress who has really, really strict convictions that they've stood by. Maybe one or two people, Alex. No, I mean, I think widely the, the slogan widely acknowledges consistency. Thy name is Paul, um, <laughs> and, that, and that I mean, and that consistency is why I, I, I've been to you know on the campaign trail. I've, I've been to your rallies. I've seen those crowds where it's you know it's it's folks in their seventies, it's folks in their eighties, it's young really young people. It's, too. it's it's you know and a lot of Canadians. <laughs> I, I don't know why. That's what I found. They, they want to they want to The message of liberty is universal. <laughs> we get a lot of messages from almost yeah, every country in the world. Here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but and yet the standard bearer for the party right now is someone who has been uh, attacked roundly for having no consistency in any of his platform positions. So it does, I mean, when you look at the Republican Party, it's not just Democrats who say this. There is a certain sense that it, it, it is in crisis. And I guess the question is, you know, depending on what happens in the fall and November, is there going to be time where the Republican Party spends some time on the psychiatrist's couch and thinks, OK, <laughs> we need to sort of circle the wagons and, and figure out what we really believe in? Well, our goal, if we're not going to be the nominee, if I'm not going to be the nominee, the goal is is to show that there's a political benefit toward accepting some of the views that we have or all the views that we have, that there's a benefit. Because most people aren't driven by philosophy in government, believe it or not. They are not. That is not their goal. Their goal is to be in office. Mm-hmm. And But there needs to be an attempt to get people to believe in something. And uh, because that's what the people want. And sometimes they need it more than others. Right now, in the last five years, why there's been so much, uh, such a great growth in our philosophy is of the need. Wars are endless. The people are tired of them. The money is, there's, is, the debt is there. The crisis has come. So therefore, the door is wide open. So I believe we're actually doing a favor for the Republican Party if they would look to us for guidance and to realize that if they would accept some of these things, they might have an easier time winning rather than just saying, capitulate conform, don't even have a discussion.
discussion. Why, why should there not be a discussion at a convention? You and I, everybody pays for this. $18 million to pay for this, and you're not allowed to have a discussion? The Democrats, they don't even have a contest. $18 million just for this PR stunt. A lot and of videos. All I want to do, <laughs> if I don't get a speech on the floor uh, uh, in the convention, all I want to do is have a little meeting and say, hey, look, uh, we have numbers, we have people, we have enthusiasm, we believe in something. Why don't you pay a little attention? And actually, I think they are. They don't know quite how to handle it. They're not quite ready to say, oh, yeah, I guess it's time we get out of Afghanistan. They're not quite ready for that. But this is what the people want. Mike Barnacle in New York has a question for you, right. Congressman Paul. Mike. Congressman, a few moments ago, I heard you talk about there is a next generation out there, another generation that have grown tired of carrying the burden uh, built up by past generations. You mentioned exploding budgets, foreign wars, and things like that. And, and I've heard you speak several times and when, in your, your condemnation of the welfare state. It would seem to me that you are headed in the direction of eliminating programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Am I wrong on that? Well, sort of, because there's a good time, a time sequence. As adamant as I am about the purity of a philosophy, I'm also very pragmatic when it comes, you know, I want to get rid of the Fed, but I also don't want to get rid of the Fed tomorrow. What I want to do is have competition with the Fed and let the Fed self-destruct. And when it comes to welfare, matter of fact, I'm probably the best protector of Social Security and some of these uh, programs for, for uh, child health care and elderly health care, because we can't afford it. It's, we're going bust, and it's all going to collapse. After you have Obamacare is totally destructive to the medical care system. I'm saying save, I want to cut a trillion dollars out of the budget, but a lot of it comes from overseas funding and war, and I say this is the only way we can preserve some of these programs and work our way out of it. I want young people to opt out of Social Security, but my goal isn't to cut. I think this is where the Republicans make a mistake. They're seen as cutting food stamps and increasing the military budget. I think it's bad politics, and so in my more pragmatic stance on how we get to the okay. place where I want to go, actually, I'm probably offering a program where some of these programs that we have taught people to be so dependent on, I would probably preserve them longer than others because we're going to lose them because of the bankruptcy that is coming. Oh, okay. And, and now, I've seen the composition of many of your rallies, and there are many, many, many young people who attend your rallies. Do you feel, in speaking to this next generation that you just spoke of, do you feel any obligation to talk to them, perhaps in instruct them about the fact that there has always been a social contract among Americans from one generation to another to help those who need help the most. Yeah, but not through government. The best way you can help people is have freedom and free markets, incentives, production, sound money. So my goals is my goal in my program is the most humanitarian. There's you're insinuating that there's a a socialism type or welfareism that is promised one generation to the next. That's not in the Constitution. That's sort of a 20th century concoction of welfare transfer, uh, you know, through force of government. But if you care about people, you have to or sound money, personal liberty, incentives to get ahead, a peace and trade. These are the things that will take care of people. And we have accepted this sort of social contract you talk about for the last 100 years. And look at where we are. Look at what's happened in the last 20 years. Look at what's happened in the year, since the year 2000. Look at what's happened in the last five years. It's downhill. So the, what do we get? For education for kids. They're graduating. They have more debt. No education and no jobs. That's what your social contract a, uh, is giving you. A bit of a personal question then. Are you on Social Security? Do you get Social Security checks? I, uh, I, I do. Well, where's the, I mean, is there? You just told younger generations that they should wean themselves off this yes, social contract. That is true, but you but, haven't but, but, done it yourself. The social security, just like I said, that I would preserve the social security yeah. the best I can. But we want to get off. But this is one program we were supposed to be paying into an insurance well, I program. I understand that. Yeah, you know, so it's don't you different. Think you than, could have set a good example for the future generations. I mean, I'm not saying you're not the wealthiest man in Congress. I know that, but you have enough means to take care of yourself in retirement. Shouldn't you have provided? 
provide an example. You know that you not to be all sanctimonious about it, but I just want to. <laughs> You're not being sanctimonious. Okay, You're just being a little sanctimonious. A little bit, but I'm just curious. <laughs> Couldn't you have set an example? No, I think that uh, I, I think the programs are so designed. Just as I use the post office too, I use sure. government highways. I, I you do that too. I use the banks. I use the Federal Reserve System. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you can't work to remove this. In the same way, on Social Security, I am trying to make a transition. Yeah. If I were 20 years old and offered that chance, I'd jump at it. And the young people jump at it because they know that uh, this is not solvent. Yeah. So I personally don't see any Have consistency you, I, in that because okay. we were supposed to have money there and we had this you know, contract. This is not like signing up for food stamps. This is signing up to, to get... I still pay Social Security. I pay more into it than I get out. Oh, that's, you know? That so, doesn't make sense, but there you go. Uh, Congressman <laughs> Paul, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much.